talked about freight. Let's move back to passengers for a minute. We all know what Amtrak is, but what about a small passenger service? Well, that's called a commuter railroad. A commuter railroad is defined as a passenger rail transport service that primarily operates in the center of the city or middle to outer suburbs beyond 10 miles. And here are a couple of examples we'll talk about today. The first one we'll talk about is Virginia Railway Express, or known as VRE. They're based in Alexandria, just on the other, just on the other side of the nation's capital. This is a 90-mile commuter service, a relatively small commuter service. They serve 19 stations in northern Virginia to our nation's capital's Union Station. The VRA was founded in 1992, just a few years after the Buckingham Branch, and they were founded by the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission, or the NVTC, and the Potomac and Ramahan Transportation Committee, or PRTC. And here are just a few stations that they serve. They serve Alexander, where this photo was taken, and this photo goes to its respected owner. They also serve Fredericksburg, Lorton, Virginia, our nation's capital, and Quantico, Virginia. I'm sure all of you have ridden this subway before. Raise your hand if you've ridden the metro in D.C. All right, good majority of you. This is my favorite subway system of all time. WMATA, or Washington Metropolitan Transit Authority, based in our nation's capital. They were formed by the Congress as an interstate compact between D.C., the state of Maryland, and the Commonwealth of Virginia on February 20th, 1967, just over 50 years ago. They serve the areas of Northern Virginia, the D.C. metropolitan area, and parts of the state of Maryland. Here below, I, we, I see a couple of different series of cars. The one on the left is these 2000 series cars that were put into service in the early 80s. These were manufactured by Hitachi Rail Italy, so these were built outside the United States. And on the right is Metro's newest, their 7000 series cars. These were put into service in 2015. And these were manufactured by Kawasaki, as many of you know, they manufacture motorcycles. I was proud to say my family and I rode in, in one of these cars uh, when we were at the D.C. over break. And these babies are nice. I love them. Now, let's talk about our major terminals. We are home to just a few of them. Norfolk International Terminal, Portsmouth Marine Terminal, Virginia International Gateway, the Port of Richmond, and the Virginia Inland Port. After doing some further research in the fall, the Port of Virginia ranks number seven in the United States. That is excellent for this area. Norfolk International Terminal, or NIT, my favorite port out of all of them. And I understand you all went there the other day because I saw the picture on Facebook. It's a good picture of the class. They're located in Norfolk, just on the other side of Interstate 64. They are the largest of the four ports. They operate on 648, 48 acres of land. Here in the photo, we see lots of different cranes performing many different tasks. They're removing the truck trailer, taking the containers off, and put them on the outbound ships. These cranes are called MyJack cranes. These were developed in the late 80s to early 90s, and they are specifically designed for container transport around the terminal. And uh, they have their, there's direct access for Norfolk Southern, and CSX has some access uh, through the Norfolk course of the Belline. I'm proud to say I've been there through this class. It was one of my favorite trips out of all of them. I always told your professor I don't want to go home because this place was so cool to watch how ships, trucks, and trains are all working together in this one spot. I could watch the show for the entire day. Right across the Elizabeth River is Portsmouth Marine Terminal. They worked on uh, 219 acres of land, the second largest of the four ports, and they're located off Interstate 664 in Portsmouth. Uh, Norfolk Southern has access to the Commonwealth Railway, as I previously mentioned, but CSX has both direct access and access to the CWRY. Why is this? CSX handles all the containers, all the containers, as I mentioned before. The 53-foot containers go straight to the terminal. The 20, 40, and 45-foot containers go through the Commonwealth Railway. Another part of the course of Marine Terminal is the Virginia International Gateway, and here is an aerial view of what it looks like. Port of Richmond, one of our other major terminals, based in our state capital, located right off of Interstate 95. They are the 26th largest port in the United States, and it is known as the Gateway to Central, America, to Central Virginia. 
And their 20-foot equivalent capacity is 50,000 to 60,000 TEUs, which is pretty good. And it's served by both of our class ones here in the area, Norfolk Southern and CSX, and NS performs local switching while CSX has direct access. The Virginia Inland Port, based in Front Royal, Virginia, and they've worked on 161 acres of land. And as you notice, something is different about this port. There's no water on the port. That's why it is called the Inland Port. This port is strictly trucks and trains. It's right off of Interstate 81 and 66, and they nailed over 60,000 TEUs in 2008. What does this bullet tell you? The bullet tells you that the container business right now is growing rapidly. And when, when my class went in 2017, we talked to one of the representatives, and they just expanded the lease, and they're getting ready to update the terminal in the next several years with new equipment, and the port is getting bigger. That means more trucks are coming off the highway, the railroads are going to be relied a little bit more, and the railroads are going to be hiring more conductors to take on these positions. This is a really good investment by the Port of Virginia, and hiring new employees is a good investment for the railroad, because you're always going to need people to help them. Now, almost all of you know this, I love trains. And, uh, and I have a little YouTube channel, I want to thank all of you for subscribing to my channel for the ones that do. Um, I see a lot of trains and I enjoy watching them because that's a lot of our cargo that we use that's going all, that comes here and all over the world. And trains are vital. And we're going to be seeing some trains that I've just seen, two CSX and two Norfolk Sun, just to give you a taste of what it looks, what it is. And I apologize if the sound is not working correctly. And uh, real quick, um, I told Mr. Johnson that he needed a seat belt because he's in retreat. First, we're going to see uh, one of our CSX ones that comes off the Commonwealth Railway. It's personally one of my favorite jobs on CSX. And all the trains are here gave me horn shows, and I'm happy with that. And this is about five minutes from my house. First train of 2019. CMACGM, I understand y'all went there uh, the other day as well. Uh, you see them, Mersh, which is here in the area as well. Um, Text in fact is an American company. They're based in New Jersey, I believe. And let me mention one more. Piano Neilwood, as you see here, I believe they're based in England. And you see a lot of 40-foot uh, containers. We'll see a triple stack here in a second. For a second to show you guys a little something. This is a triple stack that I did not mention earlier. These two are 20 foot containers. It's half of a 40 foot container if you think about it. And on top is a 40 foot container. It is the car on the bottom, the two little containers on the, in the car, and the top one to hold it all together. It's like a sandwich if you think about it. But that's what a triple stack looks like. And we're seeing a lot of these too. They can't stack them four high because it's too much. But these are all the containers that you, that you talked about in class that are on one of these trains. And that's taking more trucks off the highway. Sorry about the trucking association, sir. And I'm going to shift over now for a manifest train that I happened to see not too long ago that is bound for the Olympic Ports with Beltline. And in this train, you'll see a refrigerator car as well, which I was very surprised to see. Thank you. 
gray cars we talked about. A lot of gray cars. This, this train comes out of Rocky Mountain and it was 38 cars. That's pretty good for the local job. I said, who would that be? 
The answer's going to tell you in just a moment. is taken out of the train. That means the train is starting to move. Thanks, Janet. As you see, there are a couple different types of hoppers that we're seeing here. As you saw previously, this is a bath gun hopper. It's like a bathtub in your own house. A bathtub is usually used to hold water. This is actually hold, to hold more coal because it has the round bottom that allows for more coal to be held in one car. That's more coal than a transporting by, by train. The next hopper we see in the lineup is a Top Gun hopper. This, in fact, Norfolk Southern did not, did not buy these cars. They were rebuilt at run up shops and throughout the 90s. And see, it says rebody about 1996. This car was completely stripped down with a brand new body and even overhauled the trucks and everything. And a lot of them are still in, in service today. This next car coming up here is one of the new bath guns with a brand new Norfolk Southern logo. They were built in 2015 by, by Real Car America. And that's our dispatcher. Okay, now we have seen our railroads in operation and me getting excited. We're going to talk about another concern that we have for our railroads, and that concern is the environment. <coughs> the environment has been a concern, and the EPA has been pushing for Tier 4 regulations for about the past 10 years. And all equipment, including ships, trucks, and trains, and all equipment is built to Tier 4 regulations or known as Tier 4 Final. It is the newest emissions level that is required by the EPA. It, it emits carbon and particle matter at a very low level. And here, like you saw in the coal train, this is General Electric's newest. It's called Evolution Tier 4. All the railroads have bought these. You saw the one on Union Pacific, from Union Pacific. This is one that Norfolk Southern bought. This engine was built in 2016 at Genie's Fort Worth plant. And this was in Wakefield a couple of summers ago where it was set up, I believe, for a bad coupler. And these, these engines are really pretty. It's one of my favorite newer General Electric built motors. Now, we talked about the U.S. Let's go around the globe to some of our foreign countries. A few facts, the U.S. earned about $82 billion in 2014 in freight revenue, which was an excellent year for the railroad. In Japan, they're only moving about 5% of its freight by rail, and that is quickly changing. The France, in France, their non-TGV network is in serious decline with old infrastructure and equipment. Their measurement is consisting of weight and distance, and their freight network carrying only 55 billion ton, excuse me, kilometers in 01, but scarcely reached 32 billion tons in 2013, of a decline of approximately 40% in 12 years. That is a huge decline, because the infrastructure that you're on is hundreds of years old, 
and it's not substantial to handle some weight of the trains. And the older equipment does not perform as efficiently. A bridge five over in Norfolk, one of the bascule bridges, that bridge is over 100 years old and is still in operation. The bridge number seven in Chesapeake, over 100 years old and still in operation. In Germany, their government policy and infrastructure deficiencies like France, they limit their freight trains to 2,500 feet. But in comparison, according to CSX, freight trains are averaging 7,800 feet. That is a long freight train. That's more freight that's being pulled each trip. The German rail officials have a positive outlook on the rail industry, and they're working with the government to improve the infrastructure and, al and allow the trains to be longer. In Norway, they're enjoying excellent growth right now. Their rail admin, they're, they're predicting that the traffic is doubling between 2010 and this year. What are their strategies? Well, they want to have terminal <coughs> expansions and new passing loops for trains. And they're also working with government officials to make the railroads safe and most efficient that they can. Now, let's talk about a few of the countries that I mentioned about the miles of track in the countries. The U.S. is being the largest at 140,490. China is the second largest at 75,000 miles. And Germany being number three at 25,672. Norway being the smallest at 2,540. Now, let's look into the future for a minute. Has high-speed trains changed the way we travel? Well, over the past 40 years, newer high-speed trains have been developed, and they've become very popular in Europe and Asia, and they're starting to become popular here in the U.S. And we're going to be talking about a few examples here today. Let's go back to Amtrak. After they were founded in 1971, they didn't have much to work with. The infrastructure was in terrible condition, and their equipment was not the best. So through the late 70s to about 1998, 1999, they approved a dedicated high-speed rail line called the Northeast Corridor, which runs from our nation's capital to Boston, Massachusetts. They purchased the Acela in 2000 by Bombardier Alstom. And the Acela means acceleration and excellence. They move people up to 160 miles an hour, which is very fast for an Amtrak train. They experimented with two different trains prior to the purchase of the Acela. And they are the X2000 and the ICE train. The ICE train is now used in Germany. This was manufactured by Siemens. This is the phase one, and in fact, some of these trains are actually still in service today after being rebuilt by Deutsche Bahn. The Swedish X2000 is the second. They both tested about 1993-1994. But the cars didn't like them because of one reason. The cars did not tilt when it went through the curve. The Acela was different because as the train enters the curve, the cars will tilt about as much as four degrees, depending on the speed of the train and sharpness of the cars. This is a very interesting train set. Japan Railways Group, formerly Japan National Railways, uh, they changed the name to JR in, on, April, on April 1st of 1987. They are known for the Shinkansen bullet train, which we'll talk about in a minute. They race from one end of Japan to the other at speeds up to 186 miles an hour, slightly faster than the Acela. But how did, it all, how did it all start? But if it wasn't for a strong 70-year-old man in Japan named Senji Sogo, without this man's invention, the first bullet train might not have been developed. A little bit of background on Mr. Sogo. He was a very intelligent man. He was born in 1884 while right outside of Tokyo, and he graduated from the law at Tokyo Imperial University in 1909. And he joined the railway the same, the same year. But his career began as a minor office clerk. But he is known today as the father of the bullet train. After leaving the government agency in 1926, he became part of the South Manchurian Railway. But while he was in Japan, he noticed that the railroads were going through a serious crisis. The infrastructure was in horrible shape, and they were dangerously overcrowding. But was the future of Japan's railroads in jeopardy? In 1955, with problems still happening at an alarming rate, Sogo was asked to take over as head of Japan National Railways. But this question shocked the nation, 
He was 70 years old. But can this man change the railroad? After becoming head of the railroad, Sogo, Sogo had a vision between high-speed high speed trains between Osaka and Tokyo, which is about 320 miles. His plan was to improve the current system and build new trains and new cars and make them more efficient. So, after talking over with his engineers, they went to work on designing this new train with current technology that was used in Japan in the mid-60s. And I have an example here with the traction motors being distributed throughout the train to provide equal weight. But after everything was done, the Shinkansen was launched in October of 1964, and it was a major success, not only for Japan, but for the entire continent of Asia and the entire world. And here's a couple examples of the trains. This is the bullet train that Mr. Sogo designed. I believe there are a few of these still in service today. And on the right is Japan's newest. It's their Nozami Series 700. And that's a pretty sweet looking train. Now everybody knows what France is home to. One of the fastest trains in the world today is the TGV, or Taya Encore Vitesse, which is French for high speed train. Their idea of modernizing the railway occurred in 1960 to replace older equipment and to transport passengers safer and more efficiently. The TGV first debuted and purchased in 1971 by the French National Railways, or SNCF. In 1972, it was powered by a gas turbine and at top speeds of 198 miles an hour, which was very high speed for the early 70s. But these gas turbine TGVs ran until 1973 due to the energy crisis, which suddenly made these TGVs very costly. So what did they decide to do? The same year, they electrified the TGV by getting its power from overhead wires. Since its electrification in 1973, the TGV itself, it was the Athlone Teeth, broke all records of reaching 320 miles an hour, which is extremely fast. They have 17 billion riders each year, and they have had no fatalities. That is impressive. Now, where do they serve? TGV is a large company. And they serve a few of the major, uh, major states, like I mentioned here. La Rochelle in particular because it is a major shop on the SNCF, which I believe they manufacture double-decker TGVs. And in 1976, they did what Amtrak did, but a couple of years prior. They began to go to dedicate a high-speed rail parallel line between Paris and Lyon. And the first section opened in 81, and I believe the next several sections opened between the late 80s and early 90s. And this has been an excellent investment by the SNCF. Now, long distance freight trains, we talked about railroads on how they move, on how they move cargo, but a lot of people have responded that transporting freight longer distances is definitely cheaper than air and quicker than sea. But what about transporting freight from one country to another country? A global example I have will prove the point. The China to London freight train. Two years ago, a Chinese locomotive left Yiwu, an East Coast Chinese port, as the map shows. It was found, it was Eastern bound for London, England, an 18 day, 7,500 mile trip. Some of the freight was bound to Duisburg, Germany, and the rest of it was London bound. Over 1,700 freight trains made this trip from China to Europe in 2016. More than double the previous year's figure. In conclusion of this scenario, the, the European executives have responded that Chinese rail service is quicker than sea and definitely cheaper than air. Excuse me. Now, some scientists say there's even a quicker way to get there. This train uses no steel wheels or rails. It is known as a maglev. A maglev is a train that is powered by magnets alternating between north and south. A couple of countries that have tested this feature as the train are Japan and Germany. Above on the right corner is Japan's version. This is the MLX-01, and it smashed a world speed record in 1997 of 571 miles an hour. Extremely fast. Here we see it on the 27-mile test track west of Tokyo until it was retired in 2011. This was Germany's version. As I mentioned, their railway system is Deutsche Bahn. They did a similar test on a 30-mile test track in Enslin, West Germany, to try to move passengers safer and quicker. 
But the project was canceled in 2008 due to rising costs. So, in summer, short line railroads make, make local deliveries that class ones won't make or can't make profitable. Class one railroads deliver freight such as coal and grains and machinery and consumables within the states, between the states, cross country, and even across two continents like Asia to Europe. In some cases, trains offer faster delivery than shipping by sea and definitely less expensive than shipping it by air. Due to the large volume that trains are able to carry, the environmental effects are lessened. So remember this riddle. The next time you button your shirt, put on your shoes, turn on your computer, eat a meal, turn on your lights, start your car, turn on your furnace, or walk into your own home or dormitory, you can know, I will say that again, you can know that a train made it possible. So in conclusion, railroads are important to our domestic and global economies. Job opportunities in the rail industry and the supply to the chain logistics side of business are growing rapidly. Rail industries attract employees from different backgrounds, including first responder and military, which I know some people who are from those backgrounds, to help move our raw materials and vital products to our destination safely and effectively. They also provide lifetime careers in different fields, including industrial development, locomotive engineers, locomotive conductors, and dispatchers, which I may pursue when I graduate. With the expansion of our terminals and rail lines, more freight and passengers will be moved by rail faster, safer, and more effectively in the near future. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed my presentation. At this time, I will now turn it over to you all. If you have any questions about my presentation, I'm glad to answer them. Yes, ma'am. So those, those uh, newer trains you were just talking about, are they only passenger trains? Like, they are, they are primarily passenger now, but they are slowly developing a high-speed freight locomotive. You're seeing a lot of those in Germany. Japan has some, but, but North America has not done that yet. Maybe within the next 30 years, they may come out with one for North America. Um, I've yet to see any high-speed passenger trains, just, just, the, just the trains that are here. But one of my <coughs> projects I want to do in the future is go up to the Northeast and watch and tracks to sell it go through the Northeast Corridor, like I mentioned previously. But I can really see high-speed rail taking over in the next several years. One example that I mentioned uh, about a year ago, that Norway, Norway's railroad is one of theirs is green cargo. They have 95% of their fleet is electric, is electric fleet. Only 5% of it is diesel. They get their electrical current from from, high, from, from hydropower, it's from waterfalls that actually generate the electricity. So they have actually become, they're, more, they're way ahead of the United States. And a friend of mine's dad was the CEO of the Oslo subway a few years ago, and he and I corresponded and we talked about that. So I would definitely see 